Welcome back to the second uh, lecture of uh, CMP 59G uh, nano networking. Uh, this is the slide we stopped uh, last week. So uh, before proceeding from here, we'll just be finishing uh, this chapter and starting the second chapter. Before proceeding uh, from here, if you have any questions from last week, just let me know. None? Okay, good. So uh, let's continue then. Okay, so uh, remember we uh, started have, uh, talking about the analogy between sensor networks and uh, nano networks. Because most of the uh, most possible applications of nano networks would be uh, in terms of sensing. So this, would, uh, this could be used, for example, as a nano sensor network also. That's also an option. So let's continue with that. Uh, now, when you start discussing uh, the uh, use of nano networks, then you have to consider the change in the channel. We're now talking about a totally different channel. So you have to analyze what's going on with this new type of channel. So one of the biggest differences between the regular uh, sensor networks and the nanoscale networks is in the type of the channel. In the wireless or electromagnetic radiation case, which is the conventional uh, wireless communications channel, uh, it's, they're still uh, included as a physical layer channel. So it's, it is still an option to make use of the uh, electromagnetic radiation. That's an option. But uh, in, the, in this case, the wireless radio receiver would just be another electromagnetic sensor for us. Uh, but the sensing elements now in the case of nanoscale, they're typically uh, pretty small compared to the uh, regular sensor nodes constructed at the nanoscale. For example, a single carbon nanotube radio receiver can be implemented and this has already been done. This happened to be the first human engineered nanoscale device actually. And as these uh, devices are scaling down and getting smaller, now there is a relation, as you know, between the length of the antenna and the uh, frequency used in electromagnetic transmission. Now, as the device gets smaller, of course, the antenna also has to get smaller. And when the antenna gets smaller, in that case, you have to uh, go into higher uh, frequencies because of power limitations. So nanoscale devices can be expected to operate at these extremely high frequencies in the electromagnetic uh, spectrum than the regular frequencies you know uh, you're using in current technologies. Typically, you should go into the terahertz band if you're to uh, utilize the uh, electromagnetic radiation for communications. So, Use of the infrared and optical transmission media may be an option. Free space optical communication can be used uh, to have a, an energy constrained uh, approach. The random networks of carbon nanotubes uh, deployed in the uh, environment uh, may provide a rapidly deployable communication substrate for the use of uh, transmissions. The deployment has always been a major issue also in sensor networks, but in the case of nano networks, it is even a bigger issue because you're not able to uh, deploy the uh, nodes one by one with your hand. Somehow you should be able to uh, spread these in the environment, but you cannot use most of the deployment techniques that are used in sensor networks in this case. But uh, much has been learned and as another approach. We have learned a lot from the natural systems, from the biological systems. Actually, if you look at the biological systems, most of the, uh, the actually living cells can be considered, as we discussed before, as nanomachines, and they do communicate. So if you analyze what's going on in nature between the cells, you learn a lot 
from uh, this. And if you can control this, then that would be great. Then you can mimic the same techniques now uh, under human control. So uh, that's one thing we would like to attack. And that's actually the focus of this course. As one of the techniques, uh, as one of the bio-inspired techniques, now we can consider the use of the molecular motors, which carry the information physically, in terms of carrying the molecules, or uh, the waves of information, uh, which diffuse from the cell to the environment and hopefully uh, to the destination cell. Okay, so uh, the use of molecular motors and diffusion constitute the examples of the use of biological nanoscale communication mechanisms. So, going back to the sensor networks analogy, let's assume that the sensor networks are the closest uh, uh, analog to the nanoscale networks, then the applications of the wireless sensor networks, since we very well know uh, what types of applications can be used, and there's a wide range of such applications. Now, what we can do is we can have a transition from academia to in industry uh, that could be done in a faster manner. The driving forces on the sensor network design are typically the low cost and low power criteria. So uh, if we can reduce the size of the devices, this will help us, hopefully, in reducing the power, which is extremely important. This will also reduce the cost. Further, uh, it will also help indirectly in the sense that since there's uh, lower power uh, consumption, maintenance will also be much easier, which is a great uh, cause of or source of uh, cost in a network. Okay? Especially in the case of bio-inspired networks, if the nanodevices are able to acquire energy from the environment, which means a way of energy scavenging, if we can achieve this, then it will be even easier. Okay? So we can try to pick the low-hanging fruit uh, as industrial control, home automation, military, asset tracking, and human-scale medical monitoring. These could be the first application areas of such systems. But of course, it's not limited by these. So a, a radical decrease in the size will also open up entirely new markets and preservation, uh, if possible. So if you look at the today's wireless sensor networks, they're composed of several parts, which have different capabilities. They're typically designed to be cheap so that you can deploy many of these sensor networks in the environment, especially if we cannot deploy these, our, uh, if we cannot deploy these one by one with our hands, in that case, we have to do a random deployment, which means since these nodes could be uh, placed randomly, you have to tolerate the possible uh, deployment where you have some disconnectivities, therefore you have to deploy many of these. Okay? So you have to provide many of uh, such devices. Can we open up a window or the uh, AC? I think If you can open up a window. Uh, that, okay. Sorry. If you're disturbed by the AC, just let me know. Uh, so, in the next slide, we have an abstract view of a generic sensor node. Of course, a real implementation does not always have to be the same way. So, typically, you have an application processor which will serve as your controller. From the antenna, you receive the incoming signal, you handle it with the RF transceiver, then you handle the protocol, of course. All these are done by the controller. You, of course, need RAM and ROM. Uh, you need some power source uh, over which you do power conditioning, and of course, some user interface. 
uh, and the sensing unit itself would be here in the transducer. Okay? And if possible, you try to provide energy scavenging, which would help you a lot. Now, so the nanoscale sensing element, as I said, would be here inside the transducer. Uh, and the user interface contains any management tool or control. And energy scavenging, as I said, is optional. So now, if you look at such uh, a device, uh, such a, uh, a network of such devices, then when you try to have a communication from one end, from one node, let's say, to the sink, then you should have multiple hops. So there will be some nodes in the middle, intervening nodes, that will serve as relays for this communication. Okay. So when you consider those uh, devices, you should try to ease the power consumption per node and also end to end. So you should look at how much energy is being consumed. So to allocate the relay nodes in order to minimize the overall energy consumption, you have to decide over which nodes to transmit and more important, how many hops you should have. So let's say we have k nodes, so there will be k minus 1 hops from source to destination. Now, uh, if you have k minus 1 hops, then for the distance d, the power consumed would be the sum of the power consumed by all intervening devices plus some minus alpha, which will be adjusting for the transmitter, not requiring to uh, spend any receive energy because it's anyway starting the communication. So D will be the total hop distance and the I will be the individual link lengths. Okay? So we would like to transmit the overall power that would be required for D and to do that we have to find these relay power consumptions. So the transmit power, if we consider a single link, the transmit power would be alpha 1, 1 plus alpha 2 times d to the n, where d to the n assumes a 1 over dn path loss. It's subject to such a path loss, depending on the distance. Okay? The longer the distance, typically, the higher the path loss will be. So alpha 1, 1 is typically the energy per bit. So Note that in energy calculations, we always calculate how much energy we spent for a single bit. If you can find that, then you can just multiply it with your data rate, and you will find out how much energy you would be spending in total. So consider the energy per bit in the transmitter electronics for alpha 1, 1. And for alpha 2, it's the energy dissipated in the transmitter op-amp. Okay? So the receiver energy consumption would be alpha 1, 2, which is energy per bit, again, consumed by, this time, the receiver side, the receiver electronics. And alpha 3 would be uh, the energy per bit for sensing a bit. So the total power you require would be what? Alpha 1, 1 plus alpha 2 to the, uh, times d to the n. Okay, This plus, so this was for the transmission plus this for the reception. Altogether, this sum would be for transmitting and receiving a single bit, multiply it at your data rate, and you will end up with the power that should be spended to transmit and receive a single bit for a distance of d, for one link distance. Okay? So, taking this, Okay, what we can do is we can now add these alpha 1, 1 and alpha 1, 2 together and we can represent it all together as alpha 1. Okay, just there some. Then it would be alpha 1 plus alpha, do, uh, alpha 2 times d to the n all together times r. This is just rewriting the previous equation, nothing new. Okay? Yeah, yes? Why did uh, you didn't use the alpha 3 in the equation? Well, uh, 
That would be for the sensing part. So altogether, plus you should also add alpha t. That would not be the dominating factor. That's fine. Since this, uh, since the uh, p relay at the distance of d is a convex function, and benefiting from Jensen's inequality, since uh, p relay of d is convex, and given some number of hops, k minus one is fixed, then the power can be minimized. And assuming all these nodes are actually equivalent, then we find uh, that the nodes should be equally separated, which is actually very reasonable. If everything, if all nodes are the same, it wouldn't make sense to put two of them close while keeping the others far. It's more reasonable to have all of them evenly spaced. That's, that can be also shown as uh, explained here. So that's one thing we observed. So what would be the individual link length in that case? Altogether, the distance is d. I have k of them, so it would be d over k. Okay. But what is more interesting is that there's an optimal number of hops based upon a characteristic distance, which is independent of the total transmission distance. And that would be called d characteristic. OK? So assuming all nodes are equivalent, then we can talk about a characteristic distance at which the transmission is reasonable. Beyond that, it doesn't make uh, sense to uh, transmit further. The relay power now for each link is, uh, since it's known, and the total power required to transmit a distance d with k minus one hops would be then. Now this was this part. Oops, sorry. Where is it? This part is the energy, uh, the power required to transmit to a distance of d over k. Remember all are equidistant, so d over k for all of them, and I have k of them. So that would be the total. Now we can show that the total minimum power is achieved when k opt is the greatest upper or lower bound for this d over d characteristic, where d characteristic is defined as alpha 1 over alpha 2 times n minus 1 altogether in uh, root n. So, yes. n? n would be altogether the uh, number of hops. You can look at it as k. So that would be the end of the chapter. We couldn't finish. We didn't have time last week. So if you have any questions, OK, so that was just an introduction to what we are going to discuss in the course. So we, now we skip to the second chapter. Where we start discussing molecular communications. But in this chapter, specifically molecular communications inside the cell, for which the molecular motors are used for carrying the information. So at the moment, we're, what we're going to look at in this chapter will be how you carry the messenger molecules inside the cell till the cell border. Once you are able to do this transmission, uh, then uh, beyond that, you will have to use some other mechanism, typically diffusion. That's what we are going to discuss. So this is just the outline. As you can see, <laughs> it's pretty packed. Uh, as I said, we will not be able to finish it today. Uh, so let's look at the biology of communications. So there are some mechanisms at the nano and the cellular scale uh, that are used for communications in the, uh, in the nature. And uh, 
these systems are actually transporting information from one position, from one point uh, to the other, typically used in the living cells. And the molecular motor is the one that is actually achieving this. So it is an intracellular mechanism, pay attention, it's not between the cells. Uh, communication technique used to transport uh, the information and material within the living cell and typically up to the cell membrane. Okay. In the next chapter, we will see, given I have carried the uh, messenger molecules all the way to the cell membrane, how does it go after the cell membrane? Okay. But for this chapter, we will not go into that detail. So when you look at the nanoscale, actually the view changes. Whatever you knew for the human scale is actually not significant at the nanoscale and vice versa actually. And the main reason is the following. As the objects get smaller and smaller, the ratio of surface to volume increases. Okay? And when you go down to the nanoscale, the objects become, typically the uh, molecules, become so small that the ratio of the surface of the molecule divided by the weight of the molecule, it is much higher than what you see in other objects. Okay? Then in that case, surface forces, like uh, adhesion forces between molecules, become more effective. Something we used to ignore. Like when I'm, uh, let's say, pushing this on the table, I don't care about, in the calculations, I do not consider the attractive forces between the molecules of this remote control and the molecules of the table. All these are ignored because such forces are uh, not significant in the human scale. Whereas in the nanoscale, they become very effective. In the human scale, what I considered in this friction force was the weight of the device. However, in the nanoscale, the weight of the molecule is so small that it could be ignored. So in human scale, we look more towards inertia, whereas in the nanoscale, we should look more towards surface forces and thermodynamics. So you should consider some other type of physics. That's a major uh, reason. So in the nanoscale, mechanical force and movement of mass uh, due to uh, force become more uh, apparent. The energy for all these forces in the case of biological systems comes from ATP, the adenosine uh, 5-triphosphate. Okay? That's, that's actually the source of all, all of our energy. And a complete understanding of these biological processes would be very helpful for us to understand how nanocommunications could be done in a very efficient manner. So the nano networks we can describe as interconnection of nano devices, nano machines, that will expand the capabilities of a single nano machine, which is typically not sufficient to do some significant work, but altogether they can do some significant work. So we should have collaboration or cooperation of nano machines which should share some information to achieve this cooperation which can be done by communications between these nano machines how that can be done will be learned from biology that's what we're trying to do so the nano machines are now consisting of nano scale components the machine itself may not be in the nano scale, but the important thing is the components should be in nano scale and or the medium that's being used for 
uh, information transmission, typically the carrier itself should be in the nanoscale. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, is always the uh, information are carried by this nanomotors outside of the cell, or it's just specific? Not always. There are different ways of intracellular communications. Well, uh, maybe I should correct it uh, this way. Let me see. Consider as an example, we will discuss it later on, uh, the communications uh, using gap junctions, like uh, calcium signaling, or in general, ion signaling. In that case, actually, it is still an intercellular communication mechanism because it's from one cell to the other, but you, you're not making use of the molecular motors to transmit those messenger molecules, to carry those messenger molecules to the cell membrane. There, it still goes with diffusion inside the cytoplasm. So this is one very effective method, but it is not the only method. Uh, the nanomachines need not be totally mechanical. You can have biological nanomachines or uh, cell machine hybrid devices. That's also possible. The methods for realizing a nanomachine can be very diverse and typically they will be beyond the scope of our course, of course. But they're described as having a general architecture as we will be discussing in the next table. The important things for us would be that you have these components, control unit, communication unit, reproduction unit, power unit, and sensors and actuators. The control unit will actually be executing the instructions uh, coming, for example, with the message. So you receive a message, and you should be able to decode what, was the, what the information was inside that message, and take the necessary actions to produce a result, and then finally respond to that. Okay? So that's what the control unit does. The communication unit will be managed by the control unit to achieve this task. So it should be able to transmit and receive messages. The reproduction unit is very important in the uh, nanoscale because as we discussed last week, you cannot produce nano devices using tweezers. This is not like producing Swiss watches. Okay? So you should have some lithographic methods that can produce many of these nanomachines in, in an effective manner. It is important to be able to produce a nanomachine in the lab environment to have a proof of concept. But for the real case, what you need is actually a way of producing these nanodevices in an efficient manner. You either produce these beforehand, before deployment, and then try to deploy all of these nanomachines. An alternative could be to uh, deploy one or few such nanomachines, which will go to the correct position and then reproduce there so that it will be an easier deployment. Okay? And also, if you go in this uh, way, make use of reproduction, since the reproduced nanomachines will be in close proximity, communication would be easier. Note that the communication distances, the link distances we're discussing, are typically at the levels of micrometers. So if you try to deploy, uh, produce uh, uh, all of these nano devices outside, and then try to deploy them to the target area, you should make sure that they fall, all these machines fall at distances of several micrometers or some tens of micrometers in distance to the others. If not, they will be totally isolated and they will not be able to communicate. So reproduction is a very important term here and it greatly also helps in terms of cost for us. Power, and this is uh, 
a major problem, especially if you consider uh, the bottom-up and uh, top-down approach as we discussed last week. Okay? This is actually the strongest point of uh, the biohybrid approach. And there should be a power unit that should provide energy, and there should also be some part of power unit which is able to replenish the power unit, of course. And there should be sensors and actuators that are serving as the interface between the environment and the machine. You should be able to sense what's going on in the environment. And sometimes it might be required that your device is applying some actions on the environment, making some changes. Okay? Or maybe it's triggering some changes, sometimes by sending out some uh, specific molecules to the uh, cells in the environment. So the biological nanomachines are currently the most advanced nanomachines uh, in existence, and researchers are typically trying to harness the pre-existing biological features learned from the nature to decide uh, uh, what to do. It, the molecular communications will enable us to uh, develop precise mechanisms to directly interact with in vivo cells, which means cells inside a living organism. The information can be sent or received from these specific cells within the body by allowing detection and healing of the diseases. Sometimes healing of the diseases may mean killing some of the cells, like the cancer cells. Okay? But once again, in this course, we're not trying to solve uh, the problem uh, of cancer, but we're trying to look at the communication perspective of it. Molecular logic gates, based on the relation of genetic activity and memory, are being constructed from existing biological components. People are working on biological transistors. All these are research going on. Some things have been done and some need further improvement. Cellular communication based on molecular uh, diffusion for intercellular uh, signaling also is one of the communication mechanisms, which, as I said, will be discussed in the next chapter. But in this chapter, we'll be focusing on the molecular motor. We'll start with the motors that ride along the filaments. There are filaments inside the cell, the cytoskeleton filaments. So we'll start with the motors that can walk over these filaments. We'll look at the physical aspects of a molecular motor, how it operates, its velocity, and how much information it can carry. We look at the potential for control and routing of molecular motors that reside on microtubule tracks. We look at the nature of the microtubules and how they are organized. We'll talk about the constant dissolving and reforming of microtubules. This item is important. This explains why microtubules actually need to be inside the cell. These microtubules, which constitute the filaments uh, inside, uh, for the uh, walking paths of these molecular motors, are uh, typically dissolving all the time, which means you start walking on a path, and one end of the path starts dissolving, because the molecules that constitute this filament break apart from each other. So it's dissolving at, uh, constantly, but also from the other end, you're reproducing more. The cell, the living organism cell, is, unbelie is an unbelievable mechanism. It is reusing every single molecule. So it will create uh, parts of the filament, so the filament actually gets longer, but at the other end, it will also start dissolving. These dissolving molecules will be floating inside the cytoplasm, 
And the cell will be able to reuse these molecules to create more filament. So the same molecules, actually the molecules, most of the molecules are not getting out of the cell at all. They just remain in the cell used for different purposes at different places, but they're always being reused. But of course, to achieve all these, you have to spend energy. What you're getting from outside is typically energy. You also get some other molecules, but the most important one is energy. By consuming energy, you're able to create more and more filaments. Okay? But they have a lifetime. Also, one other uh, feature of the cell is that if a cell thinks communication with, the, with that neighbor it will be useful, okay, it does that communication. If it thinks that it will not be useful or it will not be able to communicate with that cell, it doesn't. It doesn't even start. It doesn't even start. So in terms of uh, energy pres uh, preserving, it's incredibly effective. If, it, if spending some energy will not be useful, it doesn't do it. That's what uh, evolution has brought to the living uh, organisms in these millions of years. The ability to steer mo uh, molecular motors, that's what we're going to also discuss, and how a payload is generated, then attached on the molecular motor, then carried all the way to the destination, typically the cell membrane, or the other way, to some organ else. And then that payload is unloaded. And if it's coming in, it's received. If it's going out, then it is released to the environment. We're going to discuss all. Note that all these operations, creating the uh, messenger molecules, Packing them into a vesicle, attaching the vesicle to the molecular motor, then taking that molecular motor and putting it on the rail, and moving it on the rail, making it walk over the rail without getting detached, hopefully, all the way to the destination. And when you reach the destination, how do you unload it? You don't have forklifts there. So there is a way to get rid of that uh, vesicle at the back of the uh, molecular motor and then this vesicle is a, uh, you can consider it as, a, it as a spherical body made of lipid inside it you have your uh, messenger molecules now you should throw out the, uh, and you remember inside the cell membrane at the moment how do you get those messenger molecules out of that lipid structure and out of the cell through the cell membrane. We'll be discussing all these and again doing all these requires some energy to be spent so what is the cost of doing this? That's a major concern for us. We'll also be looking at that. Can you turn off the AC? Sorry. Sure. No, Sorry. Uh, let me just reduce the and increase the... If you're still disturbed, uh, I'll just turn it off completely. So, uh, there are also other molecular motors, uh, like the motors that are not associated with riding along the uh, microtubules, such as the motors using a flagellum. Now, is I mentioned briefly last week, the flagellum acts like the propeller at the back of a uh, speed motor on, uh, in the sea, like the boat trip you will have hopefully next week. Uh, it's very similar to that. So it is actually a tail-like structure, which is attached to the cell. It projects from the cell body, so it extends from the cell body to, to the environment. Uh, and it's used in some prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And it provides propulsion because it's turning. 
because typically, for example, the flagellar bacteria is spinning its flagellum, so it's stirring the liquid in the environment. This way, it's able to push itself in some direction. The flagellum is much like cilia, which is another tail-like projection from various organisms, but there are some differences. The flagellum operates with a spinning propeller-like motion, but in the case of cilia, it's uh, operating with a back and forth motion, so the way they're moving is different. The motor structures uh, differ between these two types of locomotion. Yet, another type of molecular motor, which is not written here, uh, could be used, for example, for pulling the uh, actin filaments. That helps in, for example, contracting the muscle cells. You're able to change the shape of the cell. That's what happens. When you move a muscle, actually what happens is all these cells on the muscle are contracting in one dimension. So they become shorter in length and of course thicker in that case. And this way the muscle is contracted. This is what happens actually in your arm here when you're moving it. Okay? So all the muscles here the uh, muscle cells here contract, which makes the muscle shorter, and the other end of the muscle, the tendon, is attached to this bone here, so it's pulling that bone around this joint. That is how your arm actually moves. And you have thousands of these in your body. Okay? So that's yet another use of the molecular motors. So to a non-biologist, when you look at the cell for the first time, it can be very surprising to learn that the cell is like a collection of concentration of chemicals. It's just zillions of chemicals in the cell. In fact, there is significant amount of mechanical activity working inside the cell. But all this activity is going in terms of chemical reactions as you will see with the molecular motors. There is some mechanical motion. There is a motor that is taking some load, like a porter carrying some briefcase. Okay? So there is some mechanical motion, but all this is done, as you will see, is with chemistry, actually. So you might be asking yourself, what am I doing here in this course? Because this is the computer science department. Anyways, for the subcellular scale, molecular uh, motors uh, are transporting intracellular molecular shipments throughout the cell, and some of these molecular shipments could even be the organelles of the cell. So it is possible to pull the organelles around the cell also using these motors. And everyone's DNA is being transported with these motors. Complementary strands are zipped and unzipped. You remember the DNA zipping, unzipping operations. All these are done by the molecular motors. So the cells themselves move relative to one another. For example, in the contraction of the muscle, as we discussed. And also, during the reproduction of the cell, you know, the cell splits into two. That is also related to the uh, cytoskeleton and the molecular motors, they make the cell split into two. It's not magic, okay? The molecular motors vary in size from a few nanometers, so good, it's in nanoscale, to tens of nanometers, still in nanoscale. They ride along the filaments or the rails, the microtubular rails, and the detail of the rails themselves is a fascinating and complex topic. We'll be briefly discussing those. These filaments, as we said, form the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton serves actually several purposes. One of the purposes is the cytoskeleton provides the 
railway system inside the cell over which these motors can walk. So it is forming the paths, the possible paths for the molecular motors. And strange enough, these paths are forming and deforming all the time. Okay, so it's not a fixed railway map. Okay, another service of the cytoskeleton is uh, you can consider the cell membrane as a piece of cloth. What would happen if I just take off my shirt? Of course, it wouldn't be a nice view, but if I just take off my shirt and leave it on the chair, it would just shrink down here, right? But your cell does, is not uh, so flat. What happens is the cytoskeleton actually stretches also the cell membrane from all directions so that the cell has that shape. It also serves in the splitting uh, of the cell during reproduction. It also serves in some types of cells in the movement of the cell. Consider uh, some bacteria, for example, that can crawl. The crawl operation is done by the help of the cytoskeleton. What happens is you have the cell membrane. From inside, the cytoskeleton is pushing the cell membrane. Now, if you push, this is like, you know, uh, there are the shows where the man goes into a balloon, but he's still able to walk in. How does it happen? Actually, when he's putting his uh, foot on the balloon, the balloon serves just like a cell membrane. He's actually pushing the cell membrane in one direction. Of course, meanwhile, since the whole cell has some fixed volume, the other side will come this way. Okay? This way, actually, the cell is able to walk or crawl also. That's also provided with the help of the cytoskeleton. So it's pretty useful as you can see. Uh, so in that sense, it's maintaining the shape and the integrity of the cell. The cytoskeleton is both more flexible and dynamic. It does not maintain a constant shape since it's always forming and deforming these filaments. These microtubules are not composed of rigid bones uh, with some number of joints, but rather they're very flexible. They bend at any point, and they're constantly dissolving, as we said, and also reforming. Uh, the key point about the uh, about these uh, this cytoskeleton is that the molecular motors utilize these filaments as a road or rail system, and the motors are able to attach to these rails, crawl or walk along these rails, and then, unfortunately, sometimes get detached before reaching the destination. The molecular motors can do this also while carrying a, a load on their backs, a cargo. This is typically in a vesicle. And this cargo represents or carries a packet of information, actually several copies of the same packet most of the time. The microtubule starts from an organelle, which is named as the centrosome, which serves as the center of this cytoskeleton system. And it's also called the microtubule organizing center, MTOC. That's another term for the centrosome. It's near the nucleus and, as we said, acts as the center. There, thus, the microtubular system is like a, a star-like topology. Each end of uh, a given microtubule has the polarity, typically the plus outside, and negative uh, uh, near the centrosome. 
Uh, we say microtubules, but uh, are these nanomotors going inside these tubes? Or no, they're walking on these tubes, not inside. So it Okay, it's actually a hollow structure, but it's not going through the tube. It's going over the tube. So it's not like the metro tubes. Uh, as you said, these have polarities. It's positive towards the cell membrane and negative on this side. Actually, the, that's how the motor knows which way to go. Polarity. The electrical polarity tells the motor which way to go, actually. It's going towards one of the polarities. <coughs> there are different types of molecule, uh, different types of uh, uh, molecular motors. As you said, there are different types, typically three types, the myosin, uh, kinesin, and dynein. The myosin either uh, move on these actin tracks, or they are also using them uh, to pull the filaments, the actin filaments. That's actually how you do the contraction in the muscle cells, for example. Our focus will not be on myosin, but mostly on uh, kinesin and dynein. The actin is a component of this rail system, and as you said, in the muscle cells, that's how you do the contraction. On the other hand, in the case of kinesin and dynein, what the molecular motors do is not pull them, but just walk over them. Uh, these motors are not limited to riding on these rails. They can also ride along the DNA and work in this uh, zip-unzip operation. Remember that the DNA is formed of uh, some amino acids. Uh, and it contains the blueprint for the construction of the proteins. So it encodes the proteins, uh, which are the fundamental workhorse of these uh, intracellular operations. So instead of transporting cargo, these molecular motors may also do mechanical works, as, as I said, zipping, unzipping operations for the proper function of DNA uh, and the DNA strands. Another form of molecular motors are the RNA polymers, uh, polymerases, sorry, and ribosomes, which are also mobile mechanical workshops that polymerize, assemble, uh, polymerize or assemble the RNA and the proteins into chains. You'll see some videos about these soon. The casein and the dynein move along the microtubule by converting the chemical energy into mechanical energy by the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP. What this means is the following. The molecular motor takes ATP and by, using, by hydrolyzing it, ATP is transformed into an ADP. This way, actually, you're converting this chemical energy to mechanical energy, and this way you're moving. The kinesin carries its load away from the centrosome, which means it moves towards the positive polarity, whereas in the case of tinein, it's working in the reverse direction. And the speeds and the sizes of these molecular motors are actually different from each other. Each molecular motor, kinesin or dynein, doesn't matter. They both contain, uh, have Two heads, the term is head, I would rather actually call it the leg rather than the head, because actually it is walking by making use of these heads. So for, for me, uh, the name foot would be a better choice, but anyway, it was named as a head. So it consists uh, of a head attached to the trails and the tail attached to the load. Actually, it has not one, but two heads. It, steps one of the uh, heads on a stepping stone on the uh, microtubule and moves the other one and takes that one front. So yes? Is it transportation two ways or one way? Uh, the kinase is always load, for, uh, load away and the dynamics always brings 
Yes. So they change their shape? No. Uh, the way it works is as follows. For example, with kinesin, you put the load and take it all the way to the cell membrane. It drops the load here and then it gets detached and it will float in the environment and then hopefully get a new load and then attach. So it's not changing, it's, it's not converting from kinesin to dynein and coming back and then converting once again back to kinesin and going uh, the way back. That's not the case. There are many kinesin and dynein motors in the environment, inside the cell. Some of them are always floating around, but some of them get attached to the uh, tubular system and they walk. Uh, we already talked about this. So, um, we also did this, right? There are many types of molecular motors. For example, uh, for the humans, they have, we have 45 different uh, kinesins. So it's not a single type of kinesin. There are different kinesins in the human body. Uh, each have a similar head structure to attach to the uh, microtubule. That side is the same because no matter what type of load it's carrying, it's attaching to the same microtubular system. So the head part is the same, but the tail part, which is connecting to the uh, vesicle, that part is different, depending on what type of load it's taking. Each member protein moves at a different speed, like the fastest, uh, fastest kinetins move at a rate of two to three micrometers per second. Whereas for the case of dining, it's around 14 micrometers per second. Uh, okay, these values probably do not make much sense for you. It's difficult to uh, imagine how much 14 micrometers makes. Let me give it this way. In our simulations, we take the uh, diameter of a, a single cell to be around 10 micrometers. Of course, from cell to cell it differs. This is, the, uh, this is a common uh, value for the size of a uh, cell. So 14 micrometers is around one and a half cell uh, in diameter. We told that they are the size of nanometers, right? The, uh, right. Carriers. So they are moving? Pretty fast. Pretty fast. Right? They can move. But that's the fastest, by the way. It doesn't mean all dynings uh, move at the straight. That's the fastest. Okay? So we will have a video which will make it more uh, understandable. But let me first try to give an idea uh, with this figure. This is the tail side, okay? So to this end, we're attaching the load, okay? And these are the heads. Uh, it has ADP on the uh, heads. The one that connects, and uh, there are specific points on the microtubule. This is, the, by the way, this is the microtubule. And this is the molecular motor. And on the molecular motor, it's not shown here, you have the load. Uh, when the uh, leg here, or the head here, let me use that term. When the head connects to this stepping stone on the microtubule, this ADP is uh, replaced with an ATP, and then that uh, hydrolyzes, and that ch causes a change in this shape, the zip-unzip operation, actually, which will be more visible with the video, you will understand it better there, and it will hydrolyze and ATP will turn to an ADP, actually it will be replaced by an ADP, but while that's happening, this will change its conformation, the molecule will change its conformation, which will actually move this leg to the side. 
And this way it will be walking. Okay? You will see, uh, soon see, as I said in the video. The molecular motor does operates by attaching and detaching the heads to the corresponding track positions, much like taking steps on a ladder. The steps on the track are equally spaced binding sites, uh, where you have ATPs, uh, uh, binding sites for the motor head molecule. And given that the motor head must be able to sequentially detach and reattach in a, uh, every step, it's not surprising that this is a delicate operation. And unfortunately, you're in a harsh environment where they're just passing by molecules which just hit this molecular motor. And they may cause this molecular motor to break from the uh, microtubule and float in the cytoplasm. You're trying to walk on the rail, but someone get, just hits your head and you drop from the rail. And hopefully, you may find another rail and attach there. If not, well, it's gone. Now, does we talk, we can talk now about the term processivity, which is actually showing some efficiency of the system, which is uh, used with the molecular motors to measure the efficiency of the movement. So the efficiency is now a trade-off between the rate of movement, the speed, and the ability to remain attached to the track. We would like to remain attached to the track until we reach the destination. There are three commonly used definitions for processivity. You can call it as average number of chemical cycles before detachment from the track. Because each one of these operations is a chemical operation. And you can look at one step as a cycle. So how many steps actually you're taking before you get detached from the track? Or the lifetime of the motor while in a state of attachment to the track within its working cycle. Or the mean distance covered by the motor on the track in a single run. A single run is the moment, from the moment you start, the molecular motor starts walking on the track until it gets detached. So processivity is, in general terms, we can look at it as the ratio of the time the molecular motor remains on the track walking. So to calculate this uh, processivity, let us look at one complete motor step, which means taking one leg from behind and putting it in the front as a single step or a cycle, and then assume that during the cycle, the motor spends some time tau on attached to the track for this power stroke operation for making a move, and tau off for the detached time. So the D to ratio R would be simply tau on over tau on and off, the total time. Okay? So the D to ratio is the time spent while the head is attached to the track. And the typical D to ratios of kinesins and cytoplasmic dynein are at least 50%. Whereas for the conventional myosin, it can be as low as 1%. So it's different for each type of molecule. The microtubule rail on which this motor was walking, that's composed of the alpha and beta tubulins. Uh, from these alpha and beta tubulins, you get that uh, rail. The microtubule's polarity is also determined by these tubulins, such that the alpha tubulin uh, at the, uh, is at the negative end and the beta tubulin is at the positive end. And the, most of the kinesins are positive end directed motors, which means they walk towards the positive end, which was, remember, towards the cell membrane. That's why the uh, kinesins are going towards the uh, cell membrane, whereas the dynins are working the other way around. 
And because only one binding site for a motor exists on each subunit of the microtubule, the minimum step size for the kinesins and the dynins is fixed and it's 8 nanometers. So in each step you're walking, you're taking a distance of 8 nanometers. With 8 nanometers you're making the, that 14 micrometers per second rate. So you can calculate how many steps it's taking in a second. The molecular motor uh, use one of the most common forms of energy in the nature, which is ATP. We all use it. And ATP is made out of either adenosine diphosphate, ADP, or adenosine monophosphate, monophosphate, which is AMP. And it's actually turning between ADP and ATP, or ADP, uh, AMP and ATP. So, therefore, the human, or in general, all living bodies, are consuming too much ATP during uh, their lifetimes. Actually, every day, we're turning over ATP of our body size. We're using it, of course, over and over. So, the ATPases are actually enzymes that catalyzes the decomposition of the adenosine triphosphate, ATP, into ADP. And when you do that, actually, one of the phosphates is gone. That's why it's going from triphosphate to uh, diphosphate. So there will be a free phosphate ion released. And this reaction is known as diphosphorylation. Uh, it releases energy. And this is the energy that's being used for converting to a mechanical energy. So the enzyme harnesses this uh, for other reactions. ATPase uh, sites are the places where uh, the molecular motors are attaching to the uh, microtubular uh, rails. And the motor pr uh, proteins now act like enzymes that catalyze the hydrolysis of ATP. The conversion, of the uh, molecular motors are serving like the enzymes that convert ATP to ADP. Of course, actually what they do is they convert ATP to ADP to get some energy. That's the main purpose. But that's what happens. The, this enzymatic process causes small changes in the conformation of the protein surrounding the ATP site. What that means is the following. Going back to that figure, sorry. This phosphorylation event, like ATP turned to ADP here, causes a change in the conformation of this molecule, which may, causes a movement. The conformation, the shape changes. When the shape changes, the leg moves now to the forward direction. This is actually how it's moving forward. So that phosphorylation event is uh, pretty important. So in turn, it propagates outward, the shape changes, and is ultimately amplified into a movement. These conformational changes generate sufficiently large forces that carry uh, the motor and its load in a unidirectional motion over long distances through repeated enzymatic cycles. So, let's have a look at this. Kinesin is a dimer with two identical motor heads. Each head consists of a catalytic core and a neck linker. In the cell, Kinesins pull organelles along microtubule tracks. The organelle attaches to the other end of the long coil coil that holds the two motor heads together. The organelle is not shown here. In solution, both kinesin heads contain tightly bound ADP and move randomly, driven by Brownian motion. When one of the two kinesin heads encounters a microtubule, it binds tightly. Microtubule binding causes ADP to be released from the attached head. 
ATP then rapidly enters the empty nucleotide binding site. This nucleotide exchange triggers the neck linker to zipper onto the catalytic core. This action throws the second head forward and brings it near the next binding site on the microtubule. The attached trailing head hydrolyzes the ATP and releases phosphate. As the neck linker unzippers from the trailing head, the leading head exchanges its nucleotide and zippers its neck linker onto the catalytic core, and the cycle repeats. In this way, kinesin dimers move processively, step by step, along the microtubule. I hope this movie uh, helped you also understand how this process is going. This is just repeating. But while this is repeating, as I said, since this is occurring inside the cytoplasm where there are so many molecules floating, a molecule can hit in a strong manner to the uh, molecular motor and cause it to completely detach uh, from the uh, microtubular rail and then it will be floating again with, as you heard, it said Brownian motion. With Brownian motion, the molecular motor will be just floating around and then uh, when it finds another uh, microtubular rail, it will just get st stuck there. Uh, it will stick on that uh, again. Brownian motion is completely random, right? The Brownian motion is completely random. Actually, the Something is not working with Brownian motion. Uh, what we do is, uh, in the natural case, many uh, events, especially in the nanoscale, many events occur with the uh, with completely random uh, behavior. Brownian motion is a model that mimics what is going on. With Brownian motion, you cannot estimate where a molecule will be in the next step. You may, your estimation could be that the molecule will go there, but actually it goes there. Next time you make another estimation, it will go in another place. But the idea is if you take sufficiently a large number of steps, the average of what you're simulating is almost equivalent to the average of the real thing. So this is, this works only in terms of the averages, in terms of the expected values. But note that it is not possible for us to estimate where the, uh, where the molecule will be the next time. We're just looking at the average cases. So, this rail riding class of molecular motors, as we have seen, have several common elements like the head, the tail, and in between the stalk. But there are differences among rail riding motors. For example, the kinesins has, have the smallest head, whereas a, a myosin's head is of intermediate size, and for the case of dynein, the head is very large. The tail has even more diversity according to the load because, as we said, the same motor must be able to recognize and load different kinds of cargo. Some particular motors within the myosin and kinesin superfamilies are known to be known to self-assemble into more complex structures. That's important, so they're able to improve themselves. And the most well-known among these uh, being the myosin take filament in muscles. The molecular motors are extremely small and they have therefore a very small mass. 
Now, this relates to the discussion we had about the surface volume stuff again. Due to this small mass, inertial forces are small compared to the viscous forces that come from the fluid environment, from the other molecules in the environment. So the mass or weight of the motor has much smaller impact than the uh, surrounding fluidic forces. Therefore, for the moment of this molecular motor in the environment, uh, in the fluid, when it is not attached to the rail, but in the fluid. When it is attached to the rail, we know how it works. And, uh, for example, for the case of kinesin, it moves from the minus polarity end towards the uh, plus polarity end. And there is a linear uh, rail structure, so you know where it will be in the next step. But when it is floating in the fluid, the uh, forces that affect the moment of the uh, the floating moment of the uh, molecular motor are determined by the viscous forces rather than the inertial forces. So don't expect the molecular motor to go down, for example, due to gravity. That's not the case. So when we talk about the viscous forces, then we have to talk about the Reynolds number, which actually is somehow defining this fluid. The Reynolds number is a dimensionless value because it's a ratio. It's the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. So if the inertial forces are more effective, it will be, uh, it, you will end up with a larger Reynolds number or vice versa. So it quantifies the relative importance of these two forces relative to each other, okay? So, the Reynolds number for a fluid which is flowing in a pipe or in the environment can be defined according to these parameters. So what are these parameters? We will use V for the mean fluid velocity in meters per second, D as the diameter of the flow, again in meters, yeah? Mu for the dynamic viscosity of the fluid in Pascal's time seconds or Newton seconds per meter square. Mu for the kinematic uh, viscosity, which is actually mu over rho, where rho is the density of the fluid. Q is the volumetric flow rate, and A is the pipe cross-sectional area. Now, given these parameters, then we can write the Reynolds number as density of the fluid times the mean fluid velocity times uh, d, the diameter of the flow, over dynamic viscosity. So what was that? The speed of, let's look at the values uh, that are directly proportional. The, uh, the mean fluid velocity, mainly, and the diameter of the flow, and the density of the fluid, depending on the type of fluid you have. Or the inverse proportion comes from the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. Okay? Or another way of uh, writing that would be just do the substitutions, you will have d times d over nu or q times d over nu a. So, if you look at low Reynolds number systems, a low Reynolds number is an indication of actually laminar or smooth flow. Okay? Which means the viscous forces, remember what Reynolds number was. Sorry, I went in the wrong direction. Where did I jump? Sorry. Okay, here we go. Okay. The Reynolds number, remember, was the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. So, 
in the case of a low Reynolds number, the viscous forces, which are represented by mu or nu, are dominant. Those were the terms in the denominator. Okay? Remember, these are the viscous forces, these are the inertial forces. So low Reynolds number means the viscous forces are larger, they are more dominant. This corresponds to smooth and constant fluid motion. So the molecules in the fluid run smoothly in this case, in the case of low Reynolds number. However, in the case of high Reynolds number, this time the inertial forces are dominating, like rho and v. In that case, you have turbulent flows in the environment, which end up in eddies and vertices and uh, other flu flow fluctuations. In this case, you do not have a, a, a smooth flow, but you have eddies and vertices, which, for example, typically occur in the rivers when you have an object in the middle of the river, like a rock. Around the rock and behind the rock, the flow will change. There you have eddies and vertices. Okay? So you will end up with such behaviors in the flow if you're talking about high Reynolds number. It's not a smooth flow. Okay? So intuitively, we can say viscosity is a measure of the slipperiness of the fluid we have in the environment. The more viscous it is, the more slippery the fluid is. If viscosity is higher, then you have lower Reynolds number, and therefore you have an even smooth flow. Whereas if you have low viscosity fluid, in that case the Reynolds number will be larger, and you will end up with random looking flow patterns in your fluid. Also, the, remember we also had V, which was for the mean velocity of the fluid. So if the fluid is injected to the environment with higher velocity, then this will be, remember V was in the numerator, so it will end up in a higher Reynolds number, which again means random eddies and vertices in the flow. The molecular motors, since they're very small, they will be hit on all sides by these randomly moving molecules. And the molecular motors will now experience some random forces from all environments, uh, from all directions, uh, leading to noisy motor trajectories, meaning you may expect the molecular motors to drop or detach from the rail in such flows. The models of the molecular motor motion must take both the mechanics and the chemistry into account, in this sense. Chemistry because of that moving pattern, but also mechanics due to the Reynolds number. Yeah. A good, a good question. I, I do not remember the exact values we were using. Uh, I should, uh, we will come to uh, the values we are using uh, in uh, our energy model, for example, but I really don't have those numbers uh, off the top of my head. I should check that, sorry. Uh, but the thing is, how effective uh, these two numerator and denominator are. Uh, sorry, we already talked about this. So, the Newton's law we use in the human scale cannot be used for each particle, each molecule in the environment. If you try to do that, there are so many molecules in the environment, each having its own uh, movement pattern. If you try to simulate or mimic every individual molecule, you will not be able to finish it. Okay. Therefore, we have to come up with an approximate model. That's where the Brownian motion comes into play. It provides us an approximate model for the average behavior, as I said earlier. Okay? 
So the molecular motor behaves like a particle going, undergoing Brownian motion. But with a potential force that is the result of some chemical energy. The Brownian motion is therefore a mathematical model used to describe the random movement of the particles in fluids and also in gases. The diffusion plays a large role in nanoscale network transport. So we're going to use Brownian motion not only for molecular motors, but also for communication via diffusion in the following chapter. Okay, so we'll ma be making use of uh, Brownian motion also there. So the knowledge of Brownian motion is imperative. So we'll briefly talk about Brownian motion. Just a short historic information about the Brownian motion. The Roman po poet Lucretius in his uh, poem uh, on the nature of things, he talks about actually some kind of Brownian motion. He has a vivid description of Brownian motion in the form of dust moving at random in the air. That is exactly what we mean by Brownian motion. In the case of dust, the particles are so small that now, when I just set this one free, you expect what will happen. It will just go down because it has a considerable weight. But in the case of the dust, if I release a dust particle, you cannot say it will just go down directly. It will just float in the air because the weight of that dust particle is very small compared to the viscous forces applied by the small wind in the air. Okay? That's actually what Brownian motion says. So he was very good in predicting that, actually. So let's just uh, discuss about the mathematics behind the Brownian motion. But to discuss it, let's start with this one-dimensional motion first rather than three-dimensional. We'll first do the one-dimensional and then switch to three-dimensional. Let's consider a random walk on a line. That means there is a line on which you either go forward or backwards. But the probability of going forward or backwards is the same. That means you're not walking towards a destination in a conscious manner. You're just making random moves. Okay, so you don't have a destination, just depending on what's happening in the environment, actually, the molecules hitting me from the left or right, I go left or right, or right or left, the other direction, okay? But I'm not going in the other dimensions, only one dimension, okay? So I'm taking steps delta z of equal length in each direction, left or right, with, uh, with a random direction. The final position, uh, I start from this position as taking it as the origin, and I'm sometimes going left, sometimes right, 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 left, right, left, left. Now, after having some number of steps, let's say n steps, what's my final position? That's the point, okay? So the final position is it depends on your origin and the accumulation, the sum of several steps. Some are positive, some are negative. Okay? So assuming that I start at position Z0, that's my origin, and per performing N steps, my final position after N steps is delta Z1, delta Z2, whatever, for all of these steps. Sometimes some of these are positive, some of them are negative, but all of the same length, L. So I'm taking fixed size steps. Remember, the, for example, the microtubule? There you had fixed size steps, just like that, okay? So it would be summation from one to N of delta ZI. Now, so in other words, the N is equal to summation of 
summation from 1 to n of delta zi. And now let me take the square of both sides. So zn square would be the square of this summation. OK? Or I can write it uh, this way. Write it twice. OK? Now, something interesting happens here. So zn square is equal to, now if you multiply those two summation values, you will have the summation of zj square for all j, where k and j are the same, and multiplication of zj and zk, where k and j are not the same. Two separate terms. Okay? But this zj was, remember, l, positive l or minus l. Square it, it's l square. And you have n of them. So it is n times l square for the first term, plus the second term. Okay? So the n square is equal to n l square plus uh, zj times zk, where j and k are different. Okay? Now, when they're different, sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative. Okay? So this is explaining that NL squared uh, part. If we average over large number of steps, that equation, remember some of them are positive, some of them are negative, and they're equally likely, then the expected value of the n squared would be expected value of this constant term, which is itself, so you don't need to write expected value, and the expected value of this thing. But I know that in the long run, this would have an expected value of zero, since positive and negative are equally likely. So you will end up with the expected value of the n square, which means starting from the origin, expected value of your final position after taking n steps is expected to be n times l square. Okay? Now, what I'm trying to do is actually, I'm trying to send messenger molecules with the, bar, uh, with the Brownian motion. Okay, so I'm not uh, taking steps, for example, in an uh, intentional manner, but I'm just throwing out the molecule. The molecule is subject to Brownian motion in the environment. But when my molecule arrives, it carries information. That's my point. Okay? So this packet of information is now left to the mercy of the environment, mercy of the molecules in the environment, taking steps of size L, n times. So the information, the molecule, can be expected to propagate a distance of r, where r is the square root of the expected value of zn. And when you plug in the value of zn, you will end up with l times square root of n. So for the case of the molecular motor, the particle is now moving in an aqueous environment. The motor is moving randomly among randomly moving molecules. Pay attention, we are not talking about the case when it is walking on the uh, microtubule, but we are talking about the case when it is floating in the cytoplasm. And the distance traveled between the uh, particle collisions would be L times expected value of the mean of the velocity, which is the mean velocity, times tau, which is the time between collisions. So between two collisions, with this mean velocity, you will take this much distance, right? So L would be that value. That's your step. 
from one collision to the other. The motor has some radius Rm, the radius of the molecule, uh, the radius of the motor, sorry, and it's traveling a total distance of L, and let's say the particle density is M. Then the surface area of the sphere, let's approximate the molecular motor as a sphere, the surface area would be 4 pi rm squared, and it's walking a distance of, it's traveling a distance of L, so during this time, it would be sweeping uh, a volume of 4 pi r squared times L, but the density of the environment is N, so if I multiply with that, I will find the number of collisions I will have at distance L. If I ha have a, a molecular motor floating where the radius of the molecular motor is Rm. Okay? Do you understand this? So, the mean path length between collisions is the distance traveled before one collision occurs. So, this thing all together becoming one. It, when I substitute lowercase l instead of uppercase l, because remember, l was the distance between two collisions or the distance till the next collision. That's why this is equal to 1. Okay? So defining tau as the mean time between collisions and for some given time t, then the number of steps taken in the fluid would be t over tau, just divide uh, those two values. And assuming that L was, remember our previous assumption, the mean speed times uh, that duration, the mean square distance can be shown as expected value of z squared as nl squared and substitute the values like substitute t over tau for n and instead of l squared write l times l for the first l substitute uh, speed times uh, tau and keep the second l okay so this is l squared in other words then i have Tau's cancel, I have V L T. Okay? That would be the square of the displacement. Now, that was all in one dimension. Okay, yes? You said uh, in the previous slide that uh, steps taken in a fluid, the motors does take steps. No, uh, what we mean by step is actually till uh, the uh, next collision. No, it's just, okay. In the fluid, it just... It's, it's, it's just floating. I remember, going back, uh, going back here. Mm -hmm. Here we said, we were discussing what's going on inside the fluid. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it was only collisions. I start from the origin. What I mean by step is, a molecule hits me from the right, so I go left, according to me. Okay? Another one hits from my left, so I go right. Each one's considered a step. It's not a real step. It's actually a molecule hits and I move. I'm not making those step movements with the head of the molecule, because we are not on the molecular rail at the moment. This is all diffusion inside uh, the cytoplasm, inside the fluid. Okay, now that discussion was for one dimension. How about three dimensions? Almost the same thing. Same thing repeated for all dimensions. So with three degrees of freedom for the dimensions and assuming the fluid to be in equilibrium, which means there's no flow. The fluid is in a, uh, like in a cup there is no flow in the fluid, but of course the molecules are moving. 
but there's not a constant flow from right to left or vice versa. In that case, the mean total distance traveled in each dimension would be what? We did it for z dimension. Similar things for x and y. And since I don't have any flow, uh, any flow they would be the same for all. Okay? And r square would be, each one would be equal to r square. And r is the coordinate system for the three dimensional space. Then we have the following. The expected value of r square would be three times the previous thing. Because z square was r square over three, so it's just three times z square. And let me call this as d, which is the diffusion coefficient. So the diffusion coefficient is three, that's a constant value. Uh, the uh, mean speed and L. And I incorporate, uh, we try to incorporate the probability of finding a particle at a particular position and account for the dependence in steps. So we're not assuming independent steps. We now have steps delta r hat, where r hat is a multidimensional space. And uh, time between the events is taken to be delta t constant. Remember, we're trying to simulate what will really happen. So taking delta t also to be constant. The position, the new position, after n steps in a three-dimensional space is just like the previous case. There we were doing it for a single dimension for z. Now you take r, which has x, y, and z embedded. So analogous to the one-dimensional case we did earlier, this is our starting point, and this is each step at random. So we can define a probability distribution, PR TN, which is the probability of the motor to be at position r hat at time t, given it starts from r0. And using the techniques we already did before, just repeating the same thing for the three-dimensional case, expected value of r uh, square after n steps would be for k equal to j, uh, expected value of the r square j, and for k not equal to j, uh, expected value of rj times rk, where j and k are different. But now, this is the definition of variance, and this is the definition of covariance in CES6. Okay? So the left-hand side uh, would be for, the, sorry, the left value would be uh, for Variance, the other one would be for covariance. Uh, and comparing that equation with the earlier result and uh, considering completely uh, independent steps, the variance is L squared and the covariance is zero. So substituting that, you can uh, find the result. Now, let me stop at this point 